Well, let me have a look and now at the use of the controls here on the Shape tab. And the Shape tab are ways of affecting mainly the velocity of your simulation. Some of them affect dissipation and sharpening, affect density. Uh, but in general, these are, these are controls which are going to affect the velocity of your simulation. And I've again set up a, a scene here with two pyro simulations right next to each other. And I've got some takes here which will allow me to demonstrate the various controls. So let me first of all have a look at dissipation. Uh, and what dissipation does, and here are the controls, is it allows you to make your smoke basically evaporate. And here I've got quite a high dissipation rate. So what we should see as we simulate this is uh, we can see the gray here is our smoke. And as we continue to simulate, we can see that there's far less gray on the left-hand side here because the smoke is dissipating much more quickly on the left-hand side than on the right. And in general, uh, for most uh, smoke simulations, uh, you'll want a, a certain amount of dissipation because that's the, the natural thing that uh, smoke does. Uh, next, uh, let's look at disturbance, shredding, and turbulence. And these are three ways to add different types of noise to your simulation in effect. In fact, uh, shredding does something slightly different, but disturbance and turbulence are both adding noise. So let's have a look, first of all, at disturbance. And what disturbance does, let's have a look at the controls. In fact, I will go back to the main text so that we can see them more clearly. Uh, so disturbance allows you to add very detailed noise to the velocity field. Uh, and what it essentially does is say where the velocity field, where the density field rather, is less than this value, 0.1, uh, then we'll add some, some noise uh, to the velocity. So what this is going to do is right at the edge of your smoke, it's going to introduce some fine details. The fineness of the details are determined by this block size parameter. So if you increase this, the details will get a little bit bigger. So let's have a look and see what it does in practice. So here we go. Uh, so I've got the simulation on the left here is has got disturbance applied. The one on the right has not. So let's play it through for a few frames. And we can already see here on the left hand side, and I hope this is visible in the video, uh, we can see that there are these little really fine details, wispy bits of smoke and flame right around the edge of our simulation here. And these are missing from uh, the right hand side simulation. So dissipation is really for, uh, sorry, uh, the disturbance is really for adding really quite fine details around the edge of your flames and smoke. So let's finish that simulation. And now let's have a look. Uh, and by the way, I should have said that I've increased uh, the number of voxels here for these demonstrations of the noise because you need to have quite a high voxel count. I think I've set it, uh, I've set my, my division size to 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.2 in order to be able to see the noise, which is quite hard to see otherwise. So uh, the next thing we have is, is shredding. And shredding is a pretty complicated process. Let me just go back to the main tab and we can see uh, what it does. So let's enable it here. So shredding allows you to influence the velocity field 
based on the temperature. And this is an absolute temperature. So what it's saying is below this temperature of 0.75, do something and do something different above 0.75. Uh, and what it does in effect is to squash and stretch our flames. Now uh, it uh, stretches our flames when the temperature is I think below this threshold. So when the temperature is low it stretches, in other words it increases the velocity in the y direction and when it, the temperature is high it squashes, so the temperature uh, when the temperature is high above 0.75 it's going to squash, in other words it's going to tend to move it out in the x and the z directions. Uh, and then there's a transition here uh, of a value of 0.1, so for a, a, a width of 0.1 on our temperature scale it, it, that's the length of the transition from the stretching part to the squashing part. And the amount of stretching and squashing depends on the gradient of the temperature field. That's a pretty uh, complicated process, but what it allows you to do is add additional wispiness to flames in particular. And I hope we've uh, got a take here which will show it. So let's have a look at shredding. There we go. And if I remember right, I think we just keep the right hand simulation that's right entirely straight and see what the shredding does. So what the shredding will be doing is as this cools down it's going to tend to increase the velocity in the y direction as opposed to the x and z direction. So what we should see is wispy sort of shoots coming off of the top of this flame. And we can see them there. This this is the default. There's no noise here at all. So it's a very dull simulation. And this one is starting to show that sort of detail which is being created uh, by the shredding control. So as I said before, the shredding control down here where the temperature is going to be very high because it's right in the source, uh, it's going to be tending to create a velocity moving out in the x and z directions. And here at the top, as the, as the temperature cools down, it's going to start to move those uh, elements uh, of the flames in the y direction. And this isn't a particularly good illustration uh, of how it works. Uh, I may uh, append an additional demonstration of this, but, but that gives you some sense of, of what's going on. So the next item we've got uh, is sharpening. And sharpening uh, is quite hard to demonstrate with this type of simulation. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, sharpening is, unlike most of the other controls here, it's not operating on the velocity field. It's going to change our density field. So let me change to our sharpening take. And what we should see is here on the left-hand pyrosolver. I've introduced in both cases here uh, some disturbance and some shredding so that we're getting some fine level detail. And what the sharpening control tends to do is basically do what it says. It sharpens our details. It, it makes little wisps narrower rather than broader. Uh, and hopefully we can see this. So we've got the same level of dissipation or treading applied to each simulation, but the one on the left here also has sharpening. And it's a pretty subtle effect. Um, it's quite hard to see, probably on the video because the, the resolution won't be as good, but the simulation on the left, you can just about see that those wisps coming out are narrower, more detailed, indeed sharper. So that's what the sharpening uh, control is doing. 
Let me switch off the simulation. And the next item on this shelf is the turbulence control. Now we've already talked uh, about disturbance, which is adding little small details by perturbing the velocity field, but only at the edges of your simulation where the density is very, very low. What turbulence does is, is create much more dramatic swirling motion, much bigger swirling motion uh, to add interest to your simulation. So let me turn to my turbulence take. Uh, and in this case, uh, I've got just the turbulence enabled. So we're going to have turbulence on the left hand side and no turbulence on the right hand side. Uh, and we can see straight away that what this is doing is creating these large scale effects on the velocity field and, and swirling around our flame. So I'll switch that off and talk for a second about the controls. I failed uh, in fact to talk about the shredding control uh, so I'll do that very briefly. Uh, sorry, uh, the sharpening control. So let me enable sharpening just to show you. So the sharpening control uh, works on a field, in this case density, and it has a locality value. If you increase, uh, that's the number of voxels in effect that it's going to look look at in order to try and uh, sharpen uh, the detail. Uh, if you increase uh, the locality, it will tend to compress larger features into narrow ones, so its effect becomes more dramatic as you increase this locality value. But now turning to turbulence, which is what we've got here, uh, we can see uh, that Uh, let me just turn it back to the turbulence. We can see that uh, we've got controls here uh, which allow us to back, go back to the main take and enable turbulence. So we've got a control here which is determining the size of these features and this is measured not in voxels but in Houdini units. So this is a pretty big swirl size here. So that's one Houdini unit um, so if we have a look at the grid here, um, if we, for some reason it's not showing the grid, but it's probably only three or four units wide, this box. So we're seeing you know, quite big swirls. The grain is the roughness in effect of, of the pattern. The pulse length is how it varies with time. So if we increase this, it will vary uh, more slowly with time. The seed allows you just to create a different random pattern. The influence threshold, uh, this is telling it uh, to only affect parts of the simulation where the density is above this value. So it won't tend to affect the very edges of our simulation with very low uh, density. And the turbulence is the number of octaves of uh, noise that are going to be added. And this controls the whole effect according to the density. So in this case the greater effect the velocity field will be perturbed more greatly where you have denser smoke and less uh, the velocity will be affected less where you have much lighter smoke. So that's uh, turbulence. The final uh, shaping control is confinement. So confinement and I've got to take uh, to demonstrate this. Confinement is a control which tends to emphasize swirling motions in your simulation. And for those of you familiar with who did 11 and before, uh, there used to be a control called vortex confinement. This is basically the same thing. Uh, so what it's doing is emphasizing the swirling motion within your simulation. And you can, if you want, use a field to control which parts of your simulation are affected by this uh, confinement and which are not. Uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't set it up to do that today. 
uh, but we're adding some turbulent motion in both of these simulations this time but only the left hand one will have confinement enabled and I suspect what we will see is a pretty subtle effect uh, because the turbulence will tend to predominate but as we simulate through this what we should see is the, the slightly more dramatic motion on the left hand side as compared to the right. Well, of those various types of noise that you can use to shape your flames, the one that is perhaps the most difficult to understand is shredding. And so I've constructed this separate file just to look in a bit more detail at what shredding consists of. And I should have mentioned earlier that each of those different types of noise uh, that we were looking at for shaping your pyro field are available as separate nodes, separate micro solvers. And uh, what I've done here is set up a very basic smoke simulation and then added in a gas shred node to the smoke solver, in this case rather than the pyro solver. And this allows us to look at the effect of the gas shred node in isolation. But uh, let's have a look uh, at what I've done to the scene and I've set up a couple of additional fields here. I've got a gradient field which is taking the gradient of the temperature field and I've got a gradient size field which is measuring just the the length of that gradient and I'll explain in a moment a little bit more about what that consists of. And then after our smoke solver I've got this multi solver which is calculating the gradient of the temperature field. It's then setting the gradient size to be the length of that gradient and then it sets the gradient to have unit length. That's just so that we can visualize it more easily. So if you remember, uh, the gas shred node works on the basis of a temperature threshold so it does one thing where the temperature is higher than a certain value and a different thing where it's lower than that value. And by default, that threshold is 0.75. Uh, and then what it does depends on the gradient of the temperature, uh, the size of the gradient. Well, let's uh, just have a look. And we'll see a little bit what's going on here. So I'm going to start with that gas shred node disabled and we'll have a look at the temperature field, the gradient, and the size of the gradient. So let's start uh, by just playing our simulation for a few frames. And this is a perfectly standard smoke simulation. Uh, there's one change from the normal smoke simulation, which is that I've got a, a gas dissipate node here, which is ensuring that the smoke dissipates pretty quickly and that is here. So it's got a very high subtraction evaporation rate so that's why it's evaporating fairly quickly. So let's have a look and see uh, what the temperature of this smoke looks like. And we can visualize temperature here on the smoke object node. So I'm going to turn off the visualization of the smoke itself and then turn on the visualization of temperature. And if we go to this tab, we can control how that's visualized. And let's revert this back to a range of one. So what we're seeing here is, as you'd expect, the temperature is higher nearer the source, which is at the bottom here, and lower as the smoke drifts upwards. Now, in fact, uh, the value by default uh, that we've got here in our gas shred node is 0.75 and we can easily see where the smoke has a temperature higher than 0.75 so I can 
put in 0.75. Now, everywhere that's red has a higher temperature than the value here of 0.75, and everything that's green and blue has a lower temperature. So, by default, what's going to happen here is that this smoke is going to be affected by that shred node uh, in different ways, depending on whether the smoke is in this red area or is cooler up here in the green and the blue area. So we might in fact uh, want to change our, let's just increase this, we might want to change our smoke. So for example, uh, we could give it a value of 1.5 and then more of this, this top layer would be affected. Now of course remember we're taking a slice to the center of our smoke. So the smoke on either side of this, if we were to move our plane, uh, we can see that as we move out, uh, a lot more of the smoke is below that temperature threshold, in this case of 1.5. So that's the first thing uh, this all depends on, which is the temperature. So let me turn off the visualization of temperature. And let me turn on the visualization of this gradient field that we've got here. And we're going to see rather a complicated picture. And what we're seeing here is a huge number of vectors, little uh, unit length vectors. And I'm going to zoom in to have a look at some of them. Uh, it's just about possible to see here. You may not be able to see it very clearly on the video, but almost all of them are pointing inwards here. I've got a little, there's a little arrow on the end here you probably can't see, but what they're doing is they're pointing from the outside of our area into the center of the smoke. And the reason they're doing that, let me just turn this off again, is because when you take the gradient of a field, in this case the temperature field, uh, what you do is you calculate a vector. So the gradient of a scalar field is a vector. And that points in the direction where that scalar field is increasing most quickly. So in general, what you will happen is, for example, if you were taking a, the, the, the gradient of a point up here, you would find uh, that the vector pointed down towards the hotter area of your smoke. So in general, these vectors are pointing inwards towards the center of the smoke, which is the hotter area. Let's have a look at uh, something else now, which is the size of those gradient vectors. Now, as you remember, I've normalized all of the ones that you saw here. So these were all of unit length. This field here is telling me how big they are. And we can see that the biggest uh, gradient vectors are here and here. And this means that that is the place where the temperature field is changing most quickly. Because the gradient of a scalar field, the direction points in the direction of greatest increase in temperature, and the length is proportional to how much that increase is. So in these areas, there's a very sharp change in temperature. So what will we expect a shredding node to do? Well, it's really very simple. All the shred node does is to have a look at your temperature threshold. And if your temperature threshold is above the value given here, uh, then it tends to add those gradient vectors to the velocity field. Now we know that the gradient vectors point in towards the center of the fire. So where the temperature is greater than 0.75, so right at the bottom here where we're in our hot part of the smoke, what this will tend to do is push that smoke back in towards itself. So it will counteract the tendency of the smoke or the flames or whatever field it is that you're using to expand because you'll be adding back that gradient vector which is pushing uh, towards the center of the smoke as we just saw. When the temperature is less than 0.75 however, uh, the opposite happens. It reverses the direction of that gradient vector and then adds that to the velocity. So at the top, let me just revert here to 
displaying temperature and switch this one off. So at the top here, where this temperature is lower than 0.75, uh, what you will be seeing is the gradient vectors being reversed in direction and added to the velocity. And in fact, the gradient vectors here are tending to be pointing more or less downwards. So when you reverse them, they're going to point upwards and we're going to add that to velocity. So what that is going to do is tend to push the smoke in the cooler areas up more quickly. It also has the effect of increasing the tendency for the smoke to fluctuate. It, it emphasizes turbulence in the smoke field or, or the flame fields or, or whatever you're applying your shredding to. So let me go back to visualizing our smoke, like so. And what I'm going to do is just go through those first few frames. So we can see that, so let me just play this. Unfortunately, it's re-simulating, but there we are. I think I've, let me just reverse this back. And I want first of all to show you what it's like without uh, the shred enabled. So let's turn off the shred and we'll just play this through and we can see it's a perfectly standard smoke simulation and it's tending to just drift up like a, a sort of wispy smoke. So let's now replay that with the shred enabled. And what we should see, after it's settled down for a bit, is that we're getting at the sides of the smoke here, this tendency for narrow, narrow tendrils of smoke, or flames, or whatever it is you're simulating, to shoot upwards. And that's what the shred is causing, and it makes it much more, it has this much more flame-like appearance as a result and I can increase the amount of shredding by increasing this temperature. Uh, that's not strictly true. What I'm doing here is changing the amount of stretch as regards to squash. So I'm going to tend to increase the amount which is those, those tendrils are shooting upwards by reducing the temperature like that or increasing the temperature. And we can see we're getting even more sort of flame-like effect now. Now one of the great things about Houdini 12 is it comes with a large number of pyro shelf tools which set up basic types of simulation. So I'm just going to talk through one of them now just to give you an idea of the kind of things uh, that are done in order to create a particular effect. Uh, and you can study each of them in turn yourself. So what I've set up here is a fireball effect. So this is what it looks like. Let me just give us a bit more visibility. So this is the fireball effect. There we are. So let me go into our auto.network and have a look and see what the main things that have been done in order to create that effect. In fact, let me start here with the sphere that's the source. And this is basically a pretty simple setup. Uh, we're sourcing fuel and we are applying some noise to the sphere. And we, in, in this shelf tool, they're using a little bit more cell noise uh, than standard turbulent noise. If you don't understand the difference between the cell noise and the, and the turbulent noise, have a look at the videos that I did on sourcing. But that's a reasonably standard setup. If we go into the auto.network, there are two things uh, which are creating that sense of an explosion. One of them here is on the source fuel node. And let me switch to my channel editor so that I can visualize this scale source volume. So the source fuel node is what's bringing in uh, the fuel and this parameter here scales the amount of fuel that's coming in. And as you can see, uh, it starts with a value of 1, and then at frame 5, I think it is, 
it's almost a value of 1.85 so the fuel starts off being quite uh, large and then it rapidly falls off to zero and that's why you see that burst of flame which then doesn't get sustained it just drifts up so that's animating the amount of fuel that's coming into our simulation uh, there's another parameter here which is animated on the combustion tab uh, and that's the gas released parameter and as you'll recall uh, the gas release parameter is the thing that determines how fast uh, your smoke flames and so on in your pyro simulation expands so we're starting with a huge value here of 100 so at the beginning of our simulation it's going to really expand very rapidly but by frame 10 that falls down to a value of 10 and then gradually down to a value of 14 so much more like the the default values for gas released so this is going to create that sort of expanding movement right at the beginning. A couple more observations on, on this simulation. One of which is that it cools down much less quickly than the standard default value, which is about 0.75. It has a lower buoyancy lift than the default. Uh, and that's going to mean that it, uh, its main movement is going to be this expansion rather than moving upwards but its movement upwards is going to be sustained because it's not cooling down as quickly as the standard uh, the fuel inefficiency is a little bit more than the default so the fuel is going to last a little bit longer uh, it's putting out less temperature uh, than you would normally expect i think the default here is oh well it's it's more or less the same so that's that's not having a big effect here on the shaping panel we've got a bit of dissipation so the smoke is tending to evaporate we've got a bit of disturbance in fact quite a bit of disturbance so that's going to introduce turbulence in the velocity field at the places where the density is lowest so in effect at the edge of the expanding ball of, of gas and flame where the density is low you're going to make the velocity field a little bit turbulent and then there's shredding here and in fact uh, this shredding is going to create variance because because all of the because it's basically a round uh, simulation rather than something that's heading upwards like a flame your gradients are going to be pointing inwards and this is going to vary them it's going to create a sort of bubbling effect on the outside of, of your of your fireball. So that's an example of the kind of things you can do to achieve uh, a particular pyro effect. And do have a look at the other shelf tools to see how particular effects are achieved. And I should actually mention one other thing, I think, here on the smoke tab. We're creating dense smoke. Uh, and that's another factor which leads to this nice sort of shaping, the, the sort of billowy shaping of the smoke, which is which is so nice in these types of, of explosions. So have a look at some of the other uh, other shelf tools to have a look and see how they're built. And I want to say a word or two now about shading. So I'm not going to go into huge detail on shading. Uh, I may take the opportunity in a later set of videos to talk about the pyro shader and there are some videos available on the side effect website they're inside the forum so you have to search for them but there are some videos which explain the construction of the of the pyro shader but i will give a, a very brief overview now and the first thing i'm going to start by talking about is in fact the visualization and one of the great things about houdini 12 is that it has this really superb uh, visualization of pyro effects here in the viewport and the look uh, of these is determined by the multi-field visualization type so if I turn off multi-field as you can see the visualization disappears and if I want to control the look of my multi-field uh, I can do so using this tab here and there are two components to the way uh, this is being displayed. 
there's a smoke component so this is essentially your diffuse component uh, this is going to react to light in your scene and, and be shaded that way uh, and in this case uh, it's taking the density field which is our smoke uh, we, we would have the opportunity to remap this here uh, in fact this is just keeping it the same uh, and then it's determining the color according to the field that you put here and I'm going to go through this in a, in a minute and, and show you a different way of doing things and then the next component is the emission and the emission uh, determines this coloration which is light independent this is the glowing uh, quality of the smoke and in this case the extent of that glow is being determined by the heat field which you can remap here but again this isn't actually doing anything its color is being determined by the temperature field so the hottest areas of our gas are going to be white and the cooler areas are going to be black and there's an overall scaling factor here so if I turn that off put that to zero we'll be able to just visualize our smoke so this is our smoke and I can control the density of our smoke up here on the density scale so let's just increase that and we can see our, our smoke gets a bit thicker and I could change the color of my smoke at the moment the color of the smoke is being determined by the density and it's got the same value throughout it's just this uniform gray color to make it more interesting I could vary the color using the temperature and we could use some black body coloration now we're seeing here something that looks pretty similar to what we were seeing earlier but it's important to understand uh, that actually this is the smoke reacting to a light this is not emission and that what we're doing is coloring our smoke so the hottest parts of the smoke are being colored white and the least hot parts are being colored black so let me just revert that back let's change that back to density and then we need to delete uh, these points and make this a sort of medium gray there we go so that's our smoke that's how you control the visualization of smoke and I'm going to just revert the density there back to 0.3 so let's turn to our emission tab now and as I mentioned earlier this is the scalar overall scale so this was on 1.5 I think the heat field determines your uh, how much emission there is and the temperature field is determining the color and there's an a scale factor here so that we if we were to increase like this you can see that less of the smoke because this is essentially what this does is divide the temperature field by the value here and that allows you to remap it to this zero to one scale for the color so by increasing this we're in effect making the, the field appear cooler by making these values shift along and that's why we're getting this more orange effect and as I increase that you can see we get less and less color in our emission and we could uh, have an increase this which will increase the amount of emission but the color as you can see isn't changing so you can play about with that to get a visualization which you like and let me now have a look at our material palette and I've got a shader which has been laid down by the shelf tool called Fireball. In fact, it's just a standard pyro shader. And as I said, I'm not going to go into great detail about the pyro shader. It's hugely complex. But there are essentially uh, two tabs that you need mainly to worry about. One of which is the smoke tab here, 
which determines uh, the, the smoke. Uh, and the second is the fire tab, which determines the emission. And the great thing about the pyroshader in Houdini 12 is that we can set up a look that we like in the uh, in the 3D view, and then we can set the parameters of the pyro shader to pick up the values from that visualization and apply them here in the shader. So I'm going to click here on the Utils tab, and I can transfer parameters from, in this case, the pyro node, the one that we were just tweaking the parameters of, and I'm transferring here from the visualization operation to pyro. Uh, and in this case, pyro doesn't stand for the pyro node. This is the pyro shader. And I can apply this transfer. And it should, therefore, have changed some of these parameters to match the ones that we had earlier. Let me just now render this and see whether that is indeed the case. So we can just render straight from the scene there. And hopefully, that, um, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's not worked. That's sometimes a problem. Let me set up a camera. And now let's render the camera. There we go. And we can see, broadly speaking, that's replicating the view that we had in our visualization. Let me give myself a little bit more space here. So the smoke, we've talked about the density. You can remap it. Uh, you can also give it some noise. Now, in general, you won't want to apply noise in your shader. There are a couple of reasons for this. The most important one is that it's very hard to get appropriate rest coordinates to work. You can generate rest coordinates as part of the pyro solver. There's a, there's a toggle which allows you to do that. However, they tend to stretch very rapidly. And even with dual rest fields, which is a capability that Houdini has, uh, you'll tend to find your noise being applied using the rest field will get stretched very quickly. The other reason that noise doesn't tend to work very well is you tend to want to apply it only at the edges of your smoke field, and it's quite hard to determine cutoff values which make that work consistently across your whole uh, simulation. Anyhow, I'm not going to demonstrate how it works now, the field shape tab basically doing what we saw earlier. That's allowing us to reshape our field. So we can take an input range. We can remap it to an output range. So for example, if we knew that our smoke had a density from 0 to 5, we could put 0 to 5 in here and then remap that to 0 to 1. And then we could further remap it using this ramp. Uh, and then uh, we could use these these are detailed controls enabling you to reshape that field that's coming in in this case the density field and then we can apply a color and in this case the color is being determined by the density and it's just this plain gray throughout the fire tab is basically the same so we're taking a heat field if necessary we're manipulating it a bit here and as you can see in fact we're not we're just we're just keeping it the same the only thing that is changing is is that this final amplitude here is multiplying it up uh, and it's being controlled the color of it here is being controlled by the temperature field and this is using this ramp here and this is the coloration that we're getting on our render 
And if you remember, I fiddled with the temperature range to, in effect, uh, cool it down and give us more of an orange look. And this is being done here in the Field Shape tab, where the initial range is being assumed to be 0 to 29, so it's eventually it's dividing by 29, and that's becoming the target range, and otherwise it's staying the same. Now, you may say, why 29? That's not the figure we had earlier. The transfer of parameters from the visualization to the pyro shader is not identical. Uh, the algorithm attempts to replicate the look of your visualization using the pyro shader. It's not the same as saying that it's going to replicate every parameter like for like. But in any case, if I want to change this, so let's put this down, say, to 15, uh, we can see that we're now getting much brighter colors up here. Put it down to 5, and we're getting some white at the, at the top here now. So that's remapping the shading. Uh, let me put this back to 10. And we could change the color. I could uh, make it completely weird by perhaps making this a blue color, and I need to give, give myself a little bit more space here, and I need to click this little arrow to give myself access to the colors, and let's give myself a blue color there, and that's probably going to create a slightly weird look, and I can give myself a, maybe a even darker blue here, yep, and now we're getting a, a sort of blue explosion, which is obviously not realistic. And you could apply noise here too. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. So each of these tabs basically has the ability to either set out, in this case, how, how it's going to be colored. You change the field that's determining the color, which is temperature here. Potentially you add some noise. The displacement tab allows you to use a field to drive some displacement in your smoke. This really is a very advanced uh, topic, so I'm not going to cover it now. Shading allows you to use the shader to generate some points which will allow for self-illumination of your smoke. So you can actually have the fire part of your smoke light up the, the smoke part of your smoke. The, the flames at the bottom can illuminate the smoke above. Uh, it's a very expensive process to calculate that. Again, it's, it's, it's too advanced for this shader, for this tutorial. So I think that covers the, the main points of our, uh, of our application of the pyro shader here. And I think that brings me to the end of my overview of, of the Pyro tools in Houdini 12, at least this introduction. Uh, I hope it's been useful.